together with a couple of uh, embassies and uh, uh, cultural institutes, we have been uh, arranging a new series which starts today, uh, a new European documentary film. Last year, uh, the series was held on uh, fiction films. So, uh, uh, this spring we have uh, three countries, and uh, we start with the Czech Republic. And next year it will be France, uh, next month, mm -hmm. and in April it will be Germany. Um, so today we will have a short uh, introduction into the contemporary documentary scene in, in the Czech Republic, uh, which will be given by Anna Reskova, who is visiting Stockholm this, uh, a couple of days as well. So. I hope the sun will be out a couple more times. Uh, tomorrow you're very welcome to come to Clara Biografen, just outside of the library, uh, where we will be screening uh, The Great Night, which is a Czech documentary film from 2013, I believe. And it's about um, whoever spends most of their lifetime at night. Uh, uh, I think it's a very interesting theme. And, uh, Try to go and see if the tickets, which we, uh, you can pick up in the yellow disc, or the write your name uh, on the waiting list. And I'm very positive that uh, some of you at least will uh, get in, since not always everybody turns up. And so if you're interested, please do come. So uh, I'm going to go to Thank you very much for the introduction. Um, so please remind me if there is any problem and if uh, I can speak uh, close enough to the microphone. Um, I'm very happy that you came. Um, I want to say in the beginning just a few words about myself. Um, I was studying uh, film studies uh, in Prague, in France and in Germany. So originally I was able to be a film critique. Uh, in the end, or actually during my studies, uh, I uh, started working for the Institute of Documentary Film, which is a non-profit organization based in Prague, but uh, it's an organization that operates in the region of Central and Eastern Europe. Uh, and there I have been working for 10 years. Uh, I have been working there with the documentary filmmakers from our region, I was not that much focused on the theory and history of work, but on actual development of documentaries. So um, I was helping uh, the students to edit uh, their films, to find the right structure, to find um, uh, some production strategies. Uh, we were helping uh, our filmmakers to get uh, in touch with uh, European and US or uh, Asian markets. So that's my background right now I have a little son somewhere around so if you hear some crying it's probably him so right now I, I don't work in the Institute uh, of Documentary Film anymore after 10 years I decided to quit because I kind of thought that I know already that uh, kind of work and uh, we have started with uh, my other colleagues two initiatives um, kind of from the bottom again a uh, training program for filmmakers in Eastern and Central Europe who for science documentary uh, films, and then uh, again a training program in South Caucasus for documentary filmmakers in Georgia, Armenia, and Azerbaijan. So that's what I do recently <coughs> in terms of documentary film, and then I hold some lectures and some of the activities that I can do to them, uh, also the where I uh, teach about the film industries. Um, maybe before I start, I will ask you if you could raise your hand, uh, those of you who have uh, uh, seen any Czech documentary film, just so I know. Uh, okay. <laughs> so you're very familiar with the, with the topic, probably. Uh, this is a presentation, but please feel free to ask me uh, anytime any questions, because uh, of course, we can we can then leave some space for the questions for the end of the presentation, but don't hesitate to just raise that or just just ask. Um, so, 
The presentation is called Elementary Paradoxes in Czech Republic. Uh, I will get to the reason of uh, this title at the end of the presentation. But if you say a word, documentary film in Czech Republic, um, and it's not only a reason, a phenomenon, but it, um, it's the situation of the past, let's say, 10 years, uh, white public, as well as uh, critiques, as well as scholars, uh, they would value the documentary film uh, very highly. Uh, they think it's a film of a high quality, quite unique, successful locally and internationally. I will get back to that in my presentation. It's uh, true only partly about the Czech uh, film production, but it's the kind of a, uh, it's the common feeling about uh, the Czech documentary. Some people uh, would go even further and they would think that it's the most trustful tool to depict reality, critical tool that opens up uh, debate in society. Very often documentary film is connected with a uh, high level of visual language or innovative narration strategies. In some countries in Europe, the documentary film would be taken rather as a journalistic piece that changes the world. Uh, in our country, very often it's connected with feeling that it's also a work of art. Uh, I love fiction film. Uh, now I will exaggerate a little bit, uh, but uh, in some circles, in some cultural circles in Czech Republic, the fiction film is not that, that much. Uh, it's taken as a core brother of documentary. Sometimes even uh, as, a, as a film that can be corrupt, uh, corrupted by commercial success uh, or just from the masses. So uh, a lot of critiques would uh, consider documentary film as uh, the thing that should be presented internationally um, compared to the fiction film which um, is not taken as that successful. Uh, if we compare the success of the international festivals, uh, it's true that documentary films are more successful. Uh, the Czech fiction films are uh, not traveling that much. But uh, my question for this presentation is actually it's kind of like that. How did the documentary film uh, deserve such positive critical recognition? Whether it's truly because of its qualities or if there's uh, some other reason for that. I will uh, now quickly before I get to uh, before I get to the recent production, I will get to uh, some uh, sources of influence for the documentary filming. Um, Czech Republic is quite small country with a ten million people. Um, but the tradition of documentary filmmaking is actually uh, very long. Uh, not only long, but quite continual. Uh, the reason is um, partly uh, industrial and political. Uh, after the First World War, uh, Czech Republic, or at that time Czechoslovakia, was a very strong industrial country with quite strong middle class and a lot of businesses. Uh, of big businesses like Bata or Skoda, uh, autos where um, uh, um, the, those were the industry um, uh, pioneers uh, that were um, kind of uh, helping our country to, uh, to become one of the three top um, countries in terms of industrial development in Europe. Uh, the, another reason uh, why um, why the uh, Czech Republic was uh, so strongly uh, leveled on, not, not Czech Republic uh, as such, but the films. I'll just say a few. Uh, in Czech Republic at that time, there were a couple of um, uh, strong resources of influence. Uh, uh, they did not only uh, connect uh, with the painters and with the filmmakers, but uh, very often with, um, uh, with the photographers and so on. One of the, the examples of uh, such person was Alexander Hagenschmidt. Uh, you might know him uh, as Alexander Hamid. Uh, he was originally a photographer who uh, uh, was
was very much influenced uh, by the uh, civilist movement uh, between the wars. Uh, he was uh, one of the pioneers of uh, the experimental film in Czech Republic. Uh, he was also shooting uh, films that were short, that were partly experimental, partly documentary, and um, partly also commercials. I will get to, back to that later. Later on, he married uh, Maya Daren, and um, uh, that was already at the time of uh, his uh, US emigration. So, um, so he's one of the figures uh, that stands for Czech short uh, film, uh, and uh, his influence on Czech documentary is very strong. Uh, another uh, big influence in the history of uh, Czech film was a science film. Uh, this line of, uh, of a filmmaking is also not connected at all to the fiction film industry between the wars. Uh, uh, Czech Academy of Sciences was putting a lot of money between the wars into, um, uh, into popularization of films. Actually, that's something what we would be wishing to uh, had the situation again that the science would be uh, promoted that much. I mean, at that time, the scientists felt that um, that the film might be a great tool to not not only present uh, science but also to understand it. So, for example, Professor Zalabek, uh, whose um, uh, film we can see here, or the picture of it, uh, he was shooting plants uh, to understand how they actually grow and then. Um, was making the film faster to see actually, the movements of the plants. Uh, that's another big section of the film professionals who were, um, uh, who were uh, actually working with uh, uh, such type of films. Uh, they were learning a lot about the technique and they were learning a lot about the, uh, the, the craft of the filmmaking. And also, uh, these people who were uh, paid by the Academy of Sciences, aside, they were shooting documentary films. So the film industry was uh, nurtured by uh, not only the film industry uh, itself, not only by the viewers, but also uh, by bodies uh, uh, like uh, Academy of Sciences or uh, stuff like that. Another influence, uh, uh, the history of the influence comes from the commercial uh, side. Uh, as I was mentioning, the big companies like Batia, the shoemaker, or uh, Škoda, uh, Škoda uh, car company, uh, was employing a lot of filmmakers to uh, make commercials for them. The film filmmakers were not only making the commercials, there were a lot of screening places in the shops and uh, a lot of money were put into the development of new techniques. So once again we can see Alexander Hackenschmidt, Alexander Hamid, who was partly employed by a number of commercial companies. And as there were not that many filmmakers in Czech Republic at that time, he was given quite a lot of freedom. So for example, when he was making um, this beautiful film, which is now shown uh, at documentary festivals or experimental festivals, which is called The Road, Singing, it's actually commercial for tires, but it's so beautifully made. Um, it's really like a high quality of filmmaking, but it's a commercial for tires. So, once again, this segment of industry was helping a lot the, the development of, uh, of the filmmaking, of the uh, mastering of the craft of filmmaking. DOPs were growing um, in such influence, they were learning from each other and they were mastering the techniques that were otherwise. Uh, unknown to, to him. Most of the uh, focus was put on a fiction film. Fiction film was actually the base where, um, where most of the censorship was um, uh, oriented at. Uh, most of the scripts were really hardly censored at that field. Uh, on the other side, there was a state-owned studio which is called uh, Short Film Studio, you can see it here, and also Army Film. These were the two studios that were responsible for the entire short film production. These two studios were responsible also for creating of the kind of a propaganda film or those films that were kind of promoting the regime. Aside of that, a lot of filmmakers who were employed there, they were employed, they were normal employees coming to work and leaving work in the afternoon. 
uh, they, in the end, had much more freedom than the filmmakers who were uh, making the fiction films. Uh, it's partly because of the directors of these two studios. Uh, I will not get that, that much to the details, but there was a kind of a shadow over those studios because it was not fiction film. It was not that much for ma uh, masses for white public, so there was a kind of paradoxical freedom. So in those two studios, uh, a lot of filmmakers were once again uh, working with, uh, uh, with the tradition of uh, the time uh, between the wars. They were learning from, uh, from the old films and uh, they, had, they had a chance to develop their own film language. Uh, the Czech New Wave, it's a movement uh, that is corresponding to the French New Wave. It's a very similar thing what has been happening around the world uh, in the 60s. The Czech New Wave, uh, very famous uh, for its fiction films. Um, some of the representatives of the, well, actually most of the representatives of uh, the Czech New Wave were also shooting documentary films. Uh, after the uh, occupation of the Soviet troops in Czech Republic uh, in uh, 1968, a lot of the filmmakers who were against the regime they either uh, emigrated or they started to work in the short film studio. That's what I was mentioning. Like before them, it was kind of a shelter or a safe environment. Uh, I can just show you one of the uh, one of the examples. Uh, Vera Kitelova, one of the most famous Czech uh, filmmakers, a lady who was uh, not afraid of anything, I would say, and her fiction films are uh, really widely uh, known. She was also um, making a lot of uh, shorter films, also documentaries, and also under, uh, under the shelter of uh, short film studio. So, paradoxically, uh, the tradition of a Czech documentary filmmaking, even though there, is a, that there are some political and historical ruptures, uh, this tradition is quite continual and uh, there are hardly any huge gaps. Uh, so the filmmakers could learn from each other and they could, um, uh, they could kind of kind of keep the level of the quality for making in terms of ideas, topics, and also the craft and the forum. Once again, paradoxically, uh, the biggest gap uh, uh, came after the revolution in uh, 1989. Uh, the reason is, of course, very logical because uh, uh, before, before the revolution, all the uh, film industry was owned by state. And uh, after the revolution, uh, some of the big studios were, pri were privatized, and um, and for example, the short film studio was privatized in a really strange way. And even today, it's difficult to reach the films which were archived um, during uh, during the whole time of, uh, of the functioning of the studio. Uh, it took probably 10 years uh, to the end of uh, 90s for the Czech Republic to kind of recover. From that. Uh, during 90s, uh, the documentary filmmaking was uh, kind of put down because Czech television was, that, that's the, the only public broadcaster in Czech Republic. Um, Czech television was going through quite rough transformation, so the budgets for uh, documentary films were cut down. Uh, it was difficult to kind of understand the structure of the program and the filmmakers could not really rely uh, on on the production of um, of uh, Czech television. At that time also, um, we didn't have any film act, any film law that would be kind of moderating the, the area of a, of a film, not only documentary film, but the film in general. Um, and uh, in the same time, there were no institutions that would be kind of a, organized or initiated by the film law. The film law didn't exist and the proper institutions were uh, not really uh, in place. That was a space for uh, some organizations that were starting from the bottom, but I will get back to that a little bit later. So now we have kind of covered the historical part. Uh, we are now in the end of 90s and uh, I will say 
uh, I will just outline two main influences uh, that in the end of 90s or in the beginning of the century started uh, kind of a new um, energy in, uh, in the field of documentary filming in the Czech Republic. Uh, you, uh, I don't know, uh, I will probably ask, have anyone of you uh, heard about the Czech Dream documentary film? No. So um, I, I will get to that, but actually the main uh, influence, or one of the main influences uh, in the late 90s and even today is um, uh, the one of Karol Lachek. Karol Lachek is a filmmaker who emigrated uh, in the 80s, got back to Czech Republic in the 90s, and uh, in the beginning of the century, or maybe in the end of the 90s, he also became a head of the department of documentary filmmaking at FAMU, which is the Film Academy. His films are very unique. Uh, sometimes they are not very understandable for white public, but very influential for the documentary films or documentary filmmakers in, uh, in our country. Uh, Karel Vachek, uh, I mean, he, he himself calls uh, his films anti-illusional films. Uh, uh, he is a master of so-called situational thinking. Um, he basically doesn't consider a film uh, to be some kind of work of art that describes reality, that depicts reality as such. Um, he says that uh, the film is not created and put on a DVD on, a, on some kind of a master and shown to the public. The film is only created in the, in the mental space of the viewer when uh, the viewer is watching the film. Uh, his topics are very critical, very often very critical. Uh, he's very socially engaged. Uh, he goes very much against uh, the kind of a cinema verite style, where uh, a, a kind of a fly uh, on the wall uh, style, where the filmmaker is hidden, uh, where the filmmaker is not interfering. On the contrary, Karabachek is interfering very much. He finds a kind of a general topic he would like to uh, explore, and then he um, <coughs> approaches this topic from a variety of angles. He talks to a number of people. Uh, he can hardly say whether he agrees with them or not. He looks for uh, kind of uh, inspiring personalities. Uh, and then, uh, uh, actually, his narration is not linear at all. Like, uh, there's hardly any story in his films. And uh, he basically works with um, diverse meanings that come out of situations that he provokes. Uh, his films use a lot of also um, kind of experimental way of editing. So they are not uh, difficult to watch, uh, they are not easy to watch. Very often they also last, for example, four hours. So he's quite exceptional. He is also very good uh, rhetorically. So when he uh, teaches at the Film Academy, there is a lot of uh, followers, uh, a lot of students who uh, were influenced by him. So I will mention some of the names later on when I talk about recent films. But I have to say that, for example, uh, Philip Raimunda and Vít Klusa, the authors of uh, Czech Green, uh, they are basically part of the group who, uh, that was very much influenced by Karel uh, I will just say a few words about this film for those of you who do not know it. Philip Ramunda and Nick Kursak, when they were uh, making the final film of, uh, of their studies, uh, they decided to explore the way the commercials and the, the, the commercial business works. And they um, decided to invent a fake uh, supermarket, or hypermarket, uh, it's called, uh, with the name Czech Dream. In the supermarket, everything would be so extremely cheap uh, and amazing that it should attract all the, all the people. They approached uh, Mark BBDO, the, the most expensive commercial company, and uh, asked for the campaign for the non-existing um, supermarket. Mark BBDO agreed because they, they knew that they could sell anything, even if it didn't exist. 
and the huge campaign was uh, was launched in Prague. And actually, in the end of this campaign, there was a fake opening of a fake supermarket. And of course, during the whole process, uh, these two guys were shooting the whole process. And uh, this is actually the scene which is um, uh, which is from the opening of the supermarket. Uh, there was a, a big field on which, uh, uh, in the middle of the field, you could see a big supermarket, but it was only the, the front wall. So the people, uh, when uh, the, uh, the ribbon was cut, they approached the supermarket, realized that it's a fake one, and the uh, big part of the film was uh, also about the reflection of the people who were actually tricked. Uh, of course, such a film created a lot, a lot of controversy because some people were kind of saying, uh, well, they're not really nice to the people, they just like, uh, would like to buy something that is cheap, and, and so on. On, on the contrary, they were, uh, it, it created, it created it really, it gave also a lot of inspiration to other young filmmakers to explore some, uh, some uh, issues in a more critical way to also engage in the situations in a bit more. And so on. This film was uh, the first film that was very successful in the Czech cinemas. To uh, outline another influence, uh, of course now I'm uh, oversimplifying very much, but uh, to uh, say another influence in Czech Republic uh, in the field of documentary filmmaking, I would mention Jana Ševčíková and, for example, her film uh, Old Believers. Jana Ševčíková is the type of a documentary filmmaker who would go to a um, location where she finds her topic. Uh, in the, uh, at this case, it's a uh, Carpathian community of old believers, of Orthodox. Uh, uh, Christians who live according to their own rules. It's a very closed world and nobody really knows anything about them. So she spent, for example, two years with them and one after two years she decided that she actually realized that she found the right way to approach uh, this topic and to, uh, to show how these people live. Uh, this influence uh, is not uh, I mean, uh, Jana Ševčíková doesn't have a followers, she doesn't have a huge community of young filmmakers around her. Uh, there are, of course, other filmmakers in Czech Republic who uh, rather approach their topic as a given, uh, who would um, try to um, understand the reality they see and uh, find the form to show it. But, for example, she does not interfere at all in, the, in what is happening in front of the camera. There are a lot of filmmakers like that in Czech Republic, but they are rather individuals. Um, I can say that uh, right now uh, it's, uh, it's possible. To, uh, I, I mean, right now there is already a mixture of the tendencies, but uh, 10 years ago uh, we could even say that uh, some of the filmmakers were part of the Bachic influence and the others were rather individualists, if I simplify the situation. It's not as uh, well supported as, for example, in Scandinavia. That's, that's quite clear. We have been aiming for at least 1% of uh, the state budget that would go to culture if it never happened. Uh, in terms of film, uh, the film uh, probably had, I mean, uh, the, the people from uh, from the theatre would probably not agree that the film had peculiarly uh, bad position because it was partly taken as an industry or as a you know, commercial industry and partly as an art. So I even remember when our uh, former president of Love Clubs was saying that uh, uh, the film should not be supported at all, like at all, etc. because it's uh, part of a market, the market should, uh, should uh, clear it out, or like, um, should be the, the decisive um, thing. Uh, as I was mentioning in the beginning, uh, we didn't, uh, as, as uh, the uh, collapse of the state on uh, cinematography, uh, took place in the, uh, during the revolution or after the revolution, there was a lack of uh, any kind of a legal background in Czech Republic. 
the countries around us slowly started to uh, uh, accept their own film laws that were saying okay, so the film, uh, there is a film fund, uh, there is a film archive, there is a film center that supports films, and that supports promotion of the films. There's that much of the budget and so on, and uh, there should be such relation to, uh, for example, uh, uh, the, uh, the broadcaster. In Czech we, we have been working on several drafts of the law. Uh, the first one was uh, uh, actually uh, what well, didn't pass through the parliament in the 90s already. Then there was another draft which was already um, a bit less uh, uh, in favor of the film or, or the budget of the film uh, later on. But uh, that also didn't uh, pass uh, in parliament. In 2006, uh, another film draft, uh, film act, uh, draft uh, passed through the parliament, but as it was supposed to be signed by uh, our president, he actually used his uh, uh, right to veto such a uh, film act. Uh, it was, uh, I was mentioning, uh, Václav Klaus, who uh, didn't want to uh, actually support any kind of uh, culture and stuff. So. So, uh, the countries around us, like Poland and Hungary, were slowly accepting their, uh, uh, their film acts, uh, we did not. Uh, so, the support of the filmmakers was based on um, uh, each year's uh, parliament's decision. Parliament already decided that that much money would, would be uh, given to film to, like, once a while, uh, given to film, uh, there would be such budget allocated to the front fund, but it was not based on any kind of a structure or any kind of a uh, system, systematic or uh, decision. Uh, only uh, in 2012 we accepted uh, the new fund law, and as the process has been extremely long, uh, the, the result is not as uh, good as, for example, the first draft that we started to work on in uh, 94. So, uh, so, so basically, the, the, the level of the film acts were going down and down. And now we finally work in the kind of like the legal system. Uh, there is a, a film institute or the film archive, which was um, actually changed into the film institute. Is, working, they have some uh, budget allocated, but right now um, uh, some corruption scandals start to uh, open up. We do not know, we do not have enough time to have a uh, proper experience of uh, how it actually works. Uh, as I was mentioning, for example, Poland, we still give, even even uh, we have the Film Act, we give only 23% of what Poland gives to cinematography, so it's quite a big difference. And the Polish Film Act is actually uh, made um, according to uh, the French uh, uh, support system. So they have uh, learned uh, a bit more in Europe um, than this. Uh, as I was mentioning, there are already some corruption scandals, uh, gaps in financing were um, uh, taking place uh, several times during the past 25 years or 22 years before the contact came. And uh, they of course created a big uh, unstability uh, in the market that producers could not produce their films on a daily basis, so they were always looking for some uh, other jobs to uh, feed their families. So, uh, to be a filmmaker or producer in Czech Republic, it has never been um, a steady job. It's never a steady job anywhere, but it's not only a question of a cash flow in the production company, it's a question of whether it's possible to make a film. For example, in 2012, it was uh, that there was a zero uh, Czech grant going to the support of Czech French film industry. But, as I was uh, mentioning before, the Czech Republic is kind of a, or was kind of a black hole of the film support. In the same time, paradoxically, uh, it has been a central space or central point for a documentary filmmakers from all the region. 
In 2001, uh, the Institute of European Reform was created. That's the institution where I was working almost uh, from the beginning. Uh, it was the time when the East European countries were actually not connected with the Europe. Uh, it was the time when, uh, after 10 years after each of the revolutions, uh, the independent producers only started to appear. They started to found their own production companies and they started to try uh, to produce films, to co-produce with the local broadcasters and uh, get some funding from the film funds. Uh, but they were not connected at all, even within their own countries. So the Institute of Documentary Film started the first pitching forum for uh, the East European countries. Uh, they were bringing, you know, they were at that time bringing uh, broadcasters from uh, Europe and from the US. Uh, we were not only helping to finance the films, uh, co-finance the films, but we were uh, also educating a lot of the filmmakers because the, uh, the directors were uh, very much family at that time, after the gap of the 10 years. Uh, they were only family with the local broadcasters who were at that time going through hard transformation process. So they were not aiming for big uh, quality films. They were aiming for short, small, cheap films for the local broadcasters. So we were kind of trying to influence, once again, the filmmakers to aim higher and go for the cinema distribution, and not only local, but also the uh, During the past almost 15 years already, the Institute of Documentary Film actually helped to develop over 500 documentary films uh, from the region. So if you, uh, if you name one of the uh, films from those countries, it was probably at a certain stage uh, supported by IDF. That's the, organization, either a development process, uh, input structure, or the right way of editing, or financing, or distribution, or sales. In the same time, uh, Czech Republic is a place where uh, I would say three main biggest documentary film, film festivals in the region uh, were founded. Uh, uh, the Hanover International Documentary Film Festival is very focused on uh, on the driven documentary film, and it's, uh, it was founded in 1999, and it was also one of the first very progressive festivals that uh, started to uh, include a lot of filmmakers from uh, the region, uh, bringing uh, huge names from documentary film abroad, and it means a lot for the auto driven documentary film, even now today for, for the whole region. One World is a documentary film festival focused on human rights. It's actually one of the most influential, uh, influential festivals of that type of films in the world. Uh, they have a basically chain of festivals in other countries already, focusing on human rights in, uh, in conflict areas in, uh, in countries where there's a problem with the civil society and so on. Uh, the attendance of uh, especially one world, which is based in Prague and not in Vienna as the previous one, it's based in Prague so that there is a potential of much uh, higher audience. The audience is huge. Uh, I don't know how many are, I think they have like uh, 20,000 uh, uh, viewers last year. The same thing applies for Academia Film Awards, which is uh, one of the three biggest, most influential um, festivals in the world focused on science technology. So, paradoxically, once again, a Czech Republic that has been uh, very underfinanced in terms of uh, film and especially in terms of documentary filmmaking, where the local broadcaster was not really uh, supporting documentary films, became probably also thanks to that, thanks to the huge need of, uh, of some kind of support, became kind of a mecca of uh, documentary filmmaking. Because the filmmakers took initiative and started from the bottom and uh, initiated a lot of um, events or uh, started some organizations that kind of like uh, helped themselves without being helped by the state. This is just one more thing regarding, uh, regarding the situation in Czech Republic. Uh, I will just quickly get to the films. Uh, in some countries, there is a wise system where the 
uh, uh, funding in the local broadcaster, the, the public broadcaster, uh, they are somehow coordinated. So the support from one side is well coordinated with the support from the other side. In Czech Republic, uh, the situation is very bad. The Czech television uh, has been uh, extremely uh, discontinual in a way uh, it programs films and the management has been changing uh, the commissioning editors or the combined films or cell films very often and it's not really reliable really even today. Uh, there's a lot of nepotism, political pressure, budget cuts and so on. The link with the film fund is basically not existing. The films that are aiming for the film fund support uh, are very often fighting with the Czech television uh, over the way they are created or the films that are made for Czech television have uh, had any chance with the film fund. And now I will get uh, to some specific films. I just would like to ask you very quickly because I Do you not have that much time? If you have some questions regarding that, I will show you some examples of some films, and I will always be, uh, like to kind of mention um, uh, some of the issues. They, uh, some of the films that I will be showing touch some of the issues I was talking about uh, earlier. Now I will try to play trailer. And I will have to do one thing which I did before and I learned how to do that. Thank you. 
výrazně posíleny a tím se naše lakovna ocitla na prvním místě v Evropě mezi 62 lakovnami v automobilovém průmyslu jako první nejčistší lakovna, která používá kapalinové technologie. A teď se dostaneme do místa, které je svým způsobem unikátní a to jsou tady ty lípy na levé straně. To jsou jediné stromy, které rostou na svém původním místě, se kterými se nehýbalo. Jsou to lípy, ve kterých byl ten kříž, ty boží muka. Tady, tady byla ta křížovatka těch polních cest. Kříž je přestěhovaný na druhé straně valu, tam je kločí cesta kolem školy. A ty lípy jsou jediné stromy. Those filmmakers do not believe that much uh, in uh, uh, kind of international promotion. They would uh, appreciate the festivals, but they would not be very active in terms of selling the film to the broadcasters. So they do not like to travel as much to the pitching points. So uh, this film that uh, was actually, um, uh, I mean, uh, some of the, I think it was even the Swedish broadcaster, Axel Arno, once. Uh, expressed his um, interest in this film in, uh, in, this film, in, uh, in the time of its production. Actually, the filmmakers didn't really follow uh, that uh, offer, and uh, the film that was then uh, successful at uh, festivals was not at all sold uh, internationally, which is, I think, uh, also uh, it, I will show you Another film, we'll just see if um, you can see it on the screen. Uh, it's film, uh, oh, this happens when you do not understand why, and then we will go to that slide. The film Great Night that you can see tomorrow, um, it was made by Petra Hartle and the Nut Production. Petra Hartle is a very young filmmaker who is actually not part of any kind of uh, documentary community in Czech Republic. Uh, he is quite a unique guy, he was not following uh, anyone. He was, uh, If he was influenced by someone, let's say it was Mikhail Galavaga from, uh, from Austria, but uh, otherwise he was making films according to himself. Um, this film is, uh, I will show you then a clip and tomorrow you can, you can see the full film. Uh, he actually plays a lot with the um, uh, stylized uh, situations and a little bit of acting. I mean, he works with his characters in a way that he follows them, but also he uh, is not afraid to ask them to say something that uh, would be, uh, let's say, for the film, which is something what uh, he was criticized a lot uh, uh, for, but um, anyway, this film was a um, uh, winner of, uh, like two years ago, it won the Hlava International Documentary Film Festival and other festivals later on in the region. Uh, the interesting uh, thing about the film is that, uh, as it was not very much appreciated by one of the communities of the filmmakers in Czech Republic, it was refused also in the Czech television. And um, it, uh, I mean, the, the, to be supported by the Czech television, so uh, at a certain moment uh, it uh, looked like it would not be produced at all. In the end, uh, Petr Hartle just like, didn't care and went uh, to HBO that produces uh, only one documentary film a year in Czech Republic. And actually, it was taken by HBO. It was not. Uh, Actually, HBO goes for uh, kind of like an easily uh, selling topics, uh, which I think uh, I Uh, skip 
the end and go a bit faster. Uh, as you probably understood, uh, you saw a group of the locals uh, who uh, some of them uh, sold their uh, fields uh, to uh, the company with them. Uh, this uh, filmmaker, Dave Kulstak, is also one of the couple who, uh, who made a Czech dream film. Uh, he was following the process of uh, the state uh, trying to buy the land of the local uh, farmers. Uh, there was a lot of cabbage fields uh, in that area. And it's very... Um, uh, actually, this topic uh, talks to uh, all the countries uh, in Europe where the big uh, factories are built, also uh, in Eastern Europe where the huge development uh, of such big uh, uh, factories took place recently. And, um, it had a big international potential. It actually won a number of festivals. You can probably see, I mean, uh, the translation doesn't allow you that much, but you can probably uh, understand the subtle humor that uh, comes out of it.